glad that you made it here for first service here in January on a freezing Sunday morning. But you guys said, no, I'm going to go first service. I don't care if it's pl the snow's plowed or not. We're Midwesterners. This is what we do, right? We, 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 we continue on. We, we trudge on. And so you said, I know there's a new sermon series today. I'm not going to miss it just because it's five degrees out, right? That's what you said. And we're glad that you're here. Today we are starting a brand new series, and uh, that was the plan to start actually last week. Uh, but God had other plans, and so we actually started last year focusing on the new wine of the Holy Spirit. And I hope that that was a powerful and a challenging way to start the new year for you. I've been praying for you that you are being filled up with God's Spirit for this new year. That you're filled up with a new mindset. And I hope that you're taking time, or you've been able to take some time to pray, maybe fast, and seek God, and speak new words over your lives. We said this last week, I'll say it again, words like, I am a new creation, I am transformed by the renewing of my mind, I have the mind of Christ in me, I release old and unproductive thoughts and feelings, and I let them go through Jesus Christ. I embrace new ideas from the mind of Christ. I hope you've been able to speak those words, that positivity, the word of God, into your life. But today we're starting a three-week series from the book of Habakkuk. Yes, Habakkuk. <laughs> Maybe you're familiar with, with that book of the Bible. Maybe it's gotten lost in the shuffle of all the different minor prophets that there are in the Old Testament. But I believe it's an incredibly relevant book, as we will see today when, when going through difficulties, going through hardships, and so we're going to focus on Habakkuk to start this year, kind of a, a vision series here at the gathering, because we need to continue to remind ourselves what, what is the vision, what's the mission of the gathering, and this three-week series that we start today, this series is called Write the Vision. Write the vision. And today's an introduction. We're going to look at chapter 1, but in chapter 2 of Habakkuk, the Lord spoke to Habakkuk and he told him, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. We want to continue to remind ourselves of the vision of the church for you said that there's, there's no debate, there's no wondering, you know, why does the gathering exist? What, what is their plan? We want to make sure because after time, vision leaks, right? Mission leaks if we don't continue to remind ourselves what we're here for. And this week is an introduction. It's chapter one. Uh, I want to give you a little background. Habakkuk is a prophet who lived in the same time as uh, other prophets such as Zephaniah, Jeremiah, possibly even Ezekiel and Daniel in the Old Testament. And at this time, they're nearing the end of the existence of Israel's southern kingdom. This is a time of injustice and idolatry. The threat of Babylon is looming over Israel. And this is an interesting book because it is specifically a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. And this is the first chapter that pertains to to the complaints and the questions that Habakkuk brings before God. I feel pretty confident that we can all relate, right, to bringing complaints and questions, maybe even some frustrations to God. And so I've titled this message today, The Airing of Grievances. The Airing of Grievances. Are, are there any, anyone in here familiar with Festivus? Anyone familiar with Seinfeld? I have one or two hands. I'm, I'm sad to see. Okay, there's a few more. Um, if you're not familiar with this, I'll give you just a little bit of background. A Festivus is a tradition by George Costanza's father. And he is not a fan of Christmas because he believes it's commercialized and excessive. So he creates this holiday two days before Christmas called Festivus. And what he does is he gets his whole family in a room. They have a great meal. And at the end of it, he stands up. And he brings his complaints to every single person at that table of what they did wrong to him that year. It's the airing of grievances. 
Now, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, airing your grievances in that way like Frank Costanza does. There might be times when you have to confront, confront someone that's hurt you in your life. That's absolutely biblical. But first, I recommend airing your grievances and your frustration before God. And that's what Habakkuk does. We're going to be reading out of Habakkuk chapter 1 today. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. If you don't, we'll have it on the screen. And if you're a person that loves a sermon outline, you can go to the homepage on the Church Center, and you can go to the YouVersion Bible app, search the gathering, and you can find our outline there. Let's read together the first four verses of Habakkuk. It says this, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. And justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. There's a few things here in, in this, these first few sentences, but I want to focus for a minute on the first one. It says the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. That, that word oracle, it, it actually can be translated and mean a burden. It means Habakkuk was, was seeing this burden. He was under a burden, and he cries out to God with complete honesty, Complete doubt. Habakkuk is doubting God's power and his sovereignty. And he asks, how long shall I cry for help and you won't hear? We tell you that there's violence, but you don't say. Habakkuk is completely honest before God. And as we look at how we are to air our grievances and our frustrations to God, I want us to, to think about three things when we come before God. And the first one is that we, number one, that we cry and plead to God. Cry and plead to God. Forgive me, I, I need water badly right now. <laughs> cry and plead to God. In the middle of your pain, in the middle of your doubt, we are, we are called to cry out to God. To plead with Him. To move in our life. If you look throughout this book, that the dialogue between Habakkuk and God, not once does God convict or condemn Habakkuk for saying these things to him. Saying things like, how long will you not hear me? How long will you ignore me? You know what that says, how long will you not save? It tells me this is not the first time Habakkuk has been calling out to God. He's been crying out to God for a while. How long will I continue to make my petitions, my requests, my venting to you, and you don't respond? I want you to know God's not intimidated by your anger and your hurt. He's a big God. He can handle your hurt and your pain. In fact, I'll say it this way. God is a friend to the doubters. God's a friend to the doubters. You know, it can be tough when people doubt you, right? It can cause you to have a chip on your shoulder to resent them for saying something like that. That's not how God looks at you. God is a friend to the doubters. God is a friend to the honest. And in your pain, it is better to talk to God rather than to talk about God. I'm going to say that again. It was better than you responded. <laughs> when you are angry, it is always better to talk to God rather than to talk about about God. We, we can say things like, God, I can't believe you would do this to me. I, 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 you're just saying to your friend, like, I can't believe God's not helping me right now. God's not listening to my problems. You can say that, but it is always better to talk, to talk to God in your anger than to talk about God in your anger. Think about the different times in the Bible. You look in the Bible over and over, people that brought their hurt to God. Think about Hannah. Think about her in the temple daily calling out to God for a child. Think about Abraham asking God to spare the wicked city over and over again. 
God, would you spare them for 50 righteous people, 40, 30, 20, 10 righteous people? Think about David in the caves, hiding out. Hiding from the king who wants to kill him. Over and over again, he cried out to God. Cry and plead to God because he is the only one who causes change. Don't talk about God. Talk to him. Cry out for him. I'm sure there are some people in here that you are hurting, you are grieving, and I'm asking you to bring that grief, bring that pain before God. Look at one of the things that Habakkuk says to God in, in his pain in verse 3. He says, why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? I began to think about that. Why would God make us see sin? See sin in, in our country, in our family, in our world. Why would God allow us to see destruction and violence? I wonder if we never saw sin, if we never saw violence, would we be compelled to pray? I think there's, there's a reason why God makes us see sin. I, actually, I think there's many reasons why God. I think that seeing sin can help us be convicted of our sin. I think seeing sin can compel us to feel empathy for other people. I think seeing sin can remind us of our need for a powerful Savior. Seeing sin, seeing violence and destruction should lead us to cry out for God. Be honest, if you never saw violence, if you never saw war in the world, would you remember to pray for the world? If, if you never saw a problem in our country and government, would you remember to pray for our government? we got a lot of problems in our government, but we'll just keep going. If we never saw a problem in our family, would we remember to pray for our family? I believe that we see sin to keep us humble, to value our salvation, to show us that we ourselves, we are vulnerable to sin apart from God, and to hate sin and what it causes, to feel for our neighbor, to give them grace. Truthfully, I'll say one of the reasons I love movies and books and stories it puts me in someone else's world, and I begin to feel empathy for what they're going through. Now, I've seen stories of families ripped apart from drugs and how it damages families. I've seen families that have experienced loss and abuse and sin. And my hope is that when we see sin, it compels us to cry out and plead for God to move. And let me take a minute to... To say, please don't mistake God using something in the world like sin to say that God is causing something in the world, okay? Now make it make clear, God is not the author of pain and suffering. He is not the author of sin. God loved us so much, he gave his only son into the world to forgive us of our sins. If we accept his grace, but he also gave us free will. And in our free will, we make our decisions that sometimes lead us towards making the wrong decisions and sin, and we fight against one another. God does not cause these situations, but he can use these situations to point us back to him in our desperation to, pro to cry and to plead for him to move. And Habakkuk asks questions. He brings his complaints and airs his grievances, saying, how long will you not hear me? Why do you stand back? Not only does he ask questions, he also makes statements. Look at verse 4. It says, the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. It's pretty strong language. He says, the law is paralyzed. It's ignored. He says, justice never goes goes forth. Never? Can you, can you imagine saying that to God? God, your justice never goes forth. Can you imagine saying that? I don't know how you were raised in your life, uh, but as a child for me, growing up under the supervision of my parents, using absolutes did not get us anywhere. 
if I said something, I, I always remember that saying, never, never. You, you never get to go out with your friends. Your brothers always get what they want. Saying things like that did not go well with my dad. I would say they never went well, but that would be defeating the point of what I'm trying to say. So, but when we're hurt and we're angry, that's how we talk. And thankfully, we serve a God who hears our cries and our pleas. And after Habakkuk says the wicked surround the righteous and justice goes forth perverted, this is what God responds to Habakkuk. Read verse 5 with me. He says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It gets me really excited when I see God responding to, to Habakkuk. And the response to Habakkuk's hurt and confusion and cries, God tells him to look and to see, to wonder and be astounded. And when we air our grievances, we, we are supposed to cry and plead to God. But number two, we need to look and wonder at God. Look and wonder at God. When, what I find interesting about God's response is that Habakkuk is so focused right here on Israel. He's focused on what is in front of him. But God's saying, if you want to see me at work, you're going to have to actually broaden your perspective. You're going to need to look among the nations if you want to see me moving. If you want to be in awe and wonder of me, you're going to need to keep looking outside of yourself. Because God says, I'm at work. I've not quit. I haven't changed. I haven't disappeared. He says, I'm actually doing a great work that's beyond belief, but you're going to have to look somewhere new to find me. Can I, for a minute, point back to what we talked about last week? I know you already remember. You've got your notes. You've memorized them. You know everything. But let me just, for those who weren't here, I'll remind them, okay? We talked about, last sermon, how if we're going to look for God for a new year, we may have to look him at him moving in a different way, a new pattern, a new method than he did last year. But just because he's not moving like he did before last year, it doesn't mean he's not moving. He is still at work. But we have to broaden our focus than the year before to see God at, at work. God says this to Habakkuk. And if I were Habakkuk at this point, I would start to get excited. He's going to do a, an amazing work. I'm supposed to wonder and be excited. And then this is what God says next. Read verses 6 through 8 with me. He says, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. God was doing something. He was at work. It was beyond Judah. He was raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to come and bring justice on Israel for their injustice. God actually uses a worse evil, a greater evil to come and take hold of Israel. Now you might be thinking, why would God want Israel, his chosen people, to be taken captive by the Babylonians? The Babylonians were worse than the Israelites. Okay, they, they idolized their military strength. They abused humans. They took nations through violence. You might be thinking at this point, if you're Habakkuk, God, you said to look and wonder? Yeah, I'm wondering, what are you doing? How can this be the way that you're going to move? But the answer is that Israel had to be destroyed in order for Israel to exist. Israel had to be destroyed. Israel would not have continued to exist if they continued to be left to rule themselves. 
They were headed for destruction. But being destroyed by an outside force would eventually lead them to call on God. Sometimes we have to look and wonder at what God is doing and see things beyond our perspective. Let me share a quick story. Years ago, probably about eight years ago, Shanna and I hit what I would consider one of our first uh, tests in our marriage. I was on staff at a church. She had just been hired as a, as a graphic design, a graphic designer at a firm right out of college. She had had this job for maybe a year or two. And I get a call one day, one afternoon, from Shannon. She says, she calls me, she's a little bit upset. She says, I've been let go. They don't have enough work for me, and I've been let go from my job. We were not expecting this, right? This was kind of sudden news. And I said, okay, well, that's, it's all right. It's going to be okay. Let's, we'll just meet at home here soon. We'll talk about it. And it was surprising. It was a little emotional. But we know things can happen. We weren't going to lose our heads over this. We, we chose that night to sit down there in our living room to pray, turn on a worship album, Shout out to Jesus Culture, Unstoppable Love, DVD, right? We just turned that on, cranked it up, and we continued to pray. We knew God had a plan. And it would, not, it would take a little bit of time for that plan to develop. But because Shannon was let go there, she was able to go to other design firms, other work, other opportunities. Later on, that would give her better pay, better hours, better experience that she would not have had if she had stayed where she was. Sometimes God has to take away something in our life to replace it with something better. Sometimes in our lives, if we continue down the path that we're headed, we are headed to destruction, and God has to change things in our life for us to broaden our perspective and see how he can work and how he can do something better than what we have. The only way Israel could move away from their injustice and sin is they had to be taken captive by the Babylonians so that they would return to God. God had to tell Habakkuk to look and to see, to wonder how God is so powerful that he could use a worse nation with zero integrity, zero righteousness, that would cause Israel to eventually regain their integrity and regain their righteousness. But you can't see God at work behind the scenes if you're not willing to look and to wonder. Let me ask, what, what's your perspective on? What are you looking at? What might you be missing? And God continues to give details on the strength of the Babylonians and the violence. I won't go through all the details. But all through verse 11, all, all up until verse 11, and then Habakkuk responds to God's answer. Read these next two verses with me, starting in 12. Habakkuk says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You, who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man? more righteous than he. Habakkuk begins the chapter with complaints to God. God responds to Habakkuk by telling him to look and to see that God is working, and Habakkuk responds with, yeah, God, I've actually got some more complaints. We've got some more problems with your answer. He responds to God saying, you're using Babylon to punish Israel? He says, how can, how can you use a worse nation to punish us? How can you remain silent? It says, when the wicked swallows up the one who is more righteous. And I want to remind you that God is so powerful that he can use anyone and anything. Nothing is beyond God's authority and control. No nation, no power, nothing that this world has to offer can compare to God's power. I hope a few people in church can say amen to that. All must bow before God 
and the, and the most wicked and terrifying nations and people in the world, they pale in comparison to our God's power. Amen. And as difficult as it was for Habakkuk to hear this truth, and to understand why God would operate, why he would work in this way, he ends his second complaint with a sign of trust. He continues on with his complaint to end the first chapter. We actually have to go to the very first verse of the second chapter to see how he ends his prayer to God. Read with me Habakkuk 2.1. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. When we air our grievances, we should cry, we should plead for God, we should look and wonder at God, and number three, we should watch and wait for God. We have to watch and wait for him. We can tell him how things hurt, how things feel unfair. We need to look and wonder at what God is doing beyond the horizon, beyond what we have eyes to see. But there are times that we need to be watching and waiting to hear from God. Not a lot of amens to that. Watching and waiting, I don't know about that part. Habakkuk's using this analogy of a watchman. A person who has to be alert at all times to see and to report what's happening. Think about that watchman. They, they cannot afford to neglect their position. They can't go away from their post because they can't afford to fall asleep and miss something that could cause damage to their city. A watchman has to continue to be alert. And I think oftentimes we ask something of God. We bring a complaint to God, and then after one prayer and maybe half a minute of listening, we give up and assume that God is not going to respond, and we return to drowning ourselves from hearing him, and we abandon our post. There are times when we must watch and wait for God. And we don't like that because waiting takes time. It's also an unknown amount of time. Most of the time, waiting on God. You know, if we knew how long we had to wait, things would be easier, right? That's why we love tracking our packages on Amazon. We want to know. That's why we open up the app five minutes after we put in the pizza or to see, is it done yet? All right, you're laughing because it's true. It's why we want to know how long is this movie before I say I'm going to it? How long is this church service before I say I'm going to it? We want to know, but waiting on God, we don't have tracking information. And think about this. If you had tracking information for God, what that would mean for you as a watchman is you could say, oh, it's not going to happen for a few days. I can leave my post. You can't leave your post when you're waiting for God. You can't. You, how much do you trust God? Do you trust him enough? To wait and continue to come before him with your request. And let me ask you this question. Do you trust God more than you trust yourself? I believe Habakkuk waited for God and he waited with the right attitude. He waited with the right posture. Mainly because of that last line. After Habakkuk says, I will watch and wait for what he will say to me. He ends with saying, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. What I will answer. No, I'm the one giving the questions to God. He, he's the one that's going to answer. He will give the answer as I'm asking and I'm waiting. I actually went for a, a better, more literal translation for what that's saying. A better translation than what I will answer concerning my complaint is how I may reply. When I am reproved. Habakkuk is saying, I'm watching and I'm waiting for God and what he will say to me. And I'm aware of how I'm going to respond once I am reproved. Once God corrects me. Habakkuk is upset and he doesn't understand what God is doing. But he also continues to keep his trust in God and he realizes that God is always right. 
that God's right, not me. If I'm in a debate with God, and there's the two of us, and one of us is wrong, guess who's wrong? <laughs> it's me. It's not God. It's me. I know that I can feel upset. I can feel like God is absent and he's abandoned me. But I know I'm wrong because the Bible says God is always present. He is always there and he's always working. So if two people in a situation, me and God, who's wrong? It's me. I'm the problem. It's me. Sorry, I gotta stop saying that. <laughs> Worship team, come join me. Help me close this down. I'm a mess. We have to be like Habakkuk who is watching and waiting. It's not waiting with arrogance. It's not waiting with disgust. It's waiting with humility. It's saying, I'm waiting for God to show me how he's right and I'm wrong. Trust in God isn't when things are good. Trust is not just when I agree or I understand what God is doing. It's when I don't understand and when things are not good, will I continue to trust? That shows us our quality and integrity in moments of difficulty. I want to end with this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He put this in his book called Strength to Love in 1963. It's filled with his different sermons. He said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Let me ask you, when you're struggling, when you're in a, a conflict, where are you standing? Are you choosing to continue to stand on God and to trust and to wait for Him? Or are you choosing to veer and choose your own decisions? The test of our trust in God is not in moments of convenience. God is capable of hearing your grievances. And I encourage you that when you doubt, when you struggle, bring your doubts before God. Bring your cries to Him. Don't talk about God. Talk to God. Would you stand to your feet at this time if you can? I'm asking you to talk to God in your pain and your suffering. To look and wonder at how God is working beyond our scope. And we have to be willing to watch and wait. To remain fervent in our prayer. We had a prayer night to start the year last Wednesday. And one of the prayer points said, Help us to be people that are fervent in our prayer, that are faithful in their prayer. I'm asking you to be faithful in prayer. And as the worship team leads us in one last song, I just want to give you a few minutes before we leave to, to call out to God, maybe to wait on God today. This front area here is open. If you need to just sit and kneel before God and wait for Him, if you need to cry out to him, maybe, maybe you had been crying for a long time and you just you gave up. It happens. Maybe you need to ask God to help me shift my perspective to see that he is working behind the scenes. Or maybe you just need to take time to pause and to wait to hear from God. And if there's anything going on in your life, if you need prayer today, to make myself available right over here, something that you're going through, whatever it is. If you need someone to pray with you, I'm here. But other, otherwise, let's take a moment to reflect, to pray. You can sing along with this song, or you can just take time to pray in your own time. Let's take five minutes before we end. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you that you encourage us to cry out to you in our struggles, in our frustrations, and that you hear us and you're working behind the scenes. Help us to take these minutes to watch and to wait, to listen to what you may be speaking to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.